Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Shamika, and I am your children and family minister. And I'm Austin, student young adult minister, and we're excited for all of y'all to be here. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat, as many of you have already done. And we are just excited to be able to worship together this morning. And along with that, we guys, we would like to join you, well, want you to join us to take a moment of silence to remember those who have fought for our country and those who have served. So if you can just take a moment of silence with me. I would like to say thank you. Today is Memorial Day. Well, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and today we just wanted to recognize that. And along with recognizing that, we also want to recognize that we are still in the business of connecting. And so if you are here, which you are, and if you are online, we have this nifty little form that helps us stay in connection with you, and it's called the Connect With Us card, Connect With Me card. And on this little card, you give us a little bit of information, and if you are here, make sure that you are writing legible. See, when I was in grade school, I didn't get S's or E's in writing, so don't write like me. Write like the ones who got the E's so that we can read your writing, okay? <laughs> so make sure you're standing in connection with us. Make sure you're standing in connection with somebody because it's really important to have somebody that you can connect with, right? And why not connect with Bethany? Right, right, Austin? And in part of that connecting, we truly do, even if you are a member, especially if you're a member, we are working through a B1 series with our church. And so two parts of that. One is we are focusing on a verse coming up and I want to know, does anyone have it memorized? <laughs> Colossians 3.14. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. All right. Woo! Awesome, awesome, <laughs> We'll awesome. continue to work on that. <laughs> But also, we are finishing up the month of May. I don't know how many days are in May. I think it goes through this week. So we have had a challenge for everyone to meet up with someone, grab coffee, grab lunch, uh, do whatever you go fishing. I don't know. Do people go fishing anymore? Uh, do something like that. Meet up with other members of the congregation that you might not would normally hang out with just to build that unity. But also as we head into June, now we're moving into June prayer partners. And so we want for you to meet up with someone else and commit to pray together once a week for the month of June. So I think we can do that. Hopefully we can manage that. I have high expectations for y'all, right? Uh, but y'all have low expectations for me. So that's the way it works, right? <laughs> Um, so we're excited. We are truly excited to see what God is going to do through all of this, focusing on being one and united together. And we have some awesome prayer warriors in our house, so not everybody call Judy or Miss Smith, okay? We got some prayer warriors in here. Don't call Judy. Everybody, y'all can't call Judy and Miss Debbie Smith, okay? Because I'm probably going to call them, so y'all can't call them. Y'all get another partner, Okay. All right, everybody, shake your head, okay? <laughs> All right, let's continue this worship service as we go to the Lord in prayer. God, we are just so thankful for who you are and what you have done. Uh, Lord, we're excited to see what you have in store for us in this worship service as we give the glory to you, God. Uh, we recognize that it's through your spirit that we are even able to come here, that we are able to worship you, that we can just bring everything to you, Lord, the good and the bad. And so I pray that we would not be terribly distracted this morning. I pray, Lord, that we would just have the mind set to hear and to see what your spirit is doing for us this morning. And as we've mentioned, we celebrate Memorial Day, but Lord, we also recognize that our allegiance is to you, God. And we are thankful for the men and women who have sacrificed themselves so we have the freedom to worship. But we also remember, Lord, that, and we don't take it for granted, that many of our brothers and sisters don't have that freedom. And so we keep them in mind in prayer as well. And so we just give all the thanks to you, God, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come we that love the Lord and let our 
joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upwards to Zion. city of God. There we shall see His face and never, never sin. There from the rivers of His grace, there from the rivers of His grace, drink and Pleasures in, drink endless pleasures in. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city. sisters live together in harmony, for harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head, ran down his beard, and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls in the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. We need each other. We need each other, we need each other, Christ dwells here with us. We need each other, we need each other, we need each other, Christ dwells here with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
sound of your great name and every fear has no place at the sound of your great name the enemy he has to leave at the sound
Jesus. Your name is the name that calms our fears. Your name is the name that we call on when we don't know what to do. Your name is the name that we lift high and we praise and we give thanks to. Your name is great. And you are greatly to be praised. Today, we come before you and we ask you to meet us in this place to give us awareness of your presence, to awaken our hearts and our minds, to help us to hear what you have to say, to receive what you have for us. Change our hearts. Give us understanding today, oh God. As we seek your face, as we try to know you better, more completely and more deeply. And as we do, God, we also ask for you to bless the tithes and offerings that we're about to give to you that we can carry forth your work, God, in this place and in our community. Bless the gift and the giver. And we pray all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to worship through our giving at this time. If you are worshiping with us online, Again, I want to extend an additional welcome to you as we worship together. And we invite you to worship through giving by accessing your online giving or pulling out your checkbook. And then for those of us who are worshiping in person today, we invite you to come forward down the center aisle and place your tithes and your offerings in the offering plates that are located on the communion table. And please return to your seats using the side aisles. And as we do, Tori Moyer is going to lead us in a song that is just very appropriate for this week as we look to Jesus in challenging times. So um, the song is My Jesus. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing You're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free Who would care that much about me? Let me 
tell you about my Jesus soul. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, amen. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. I'm a, <laughs> at this moment, I'm going to go forward and dismiss our kids. And you guys just stay in here and just keep praising. Keep, yes, amen. Yes. Y'all did. <laughs> amen. Oh, guys, <laughs> go back to Miss Tracy. <laughs> Let me tell you about my Jesus. Wasn't that beautiful? Sing hallelujahs. Mm. This morning, uh, we have set aside a time that we're calling a moment of lament. That lament has two events in mind that occurred this past week. The first one is the school shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, where 19 children, ages 9 and 10, fourth graders, and their two, te two teachers were murdered at, in an act of senseless, cold-blooded evil that is almost impossible to comprehend. Two days later, the husband of one of those teachers died of a heart attack. And we are broken. Our hearts are broken. In fact, Scripture, one of the Scriptures I will read today says that we are to weep with those who weep. And so our hearts are broken as we lament with the parents of family, the entire community of Evaldi, Evaldi, Texas. As a pastor, I cannot imagine ministering in the midst of the merciless killing of the defenseless, innocent children that died this past week. I read the headlines of one of the parents that said this, quote, we will need your prayers to get us through this. Hear that, church. We will need your prayers to get us through this. It is the intention of this action this morning to respond to this person, please, for our prayers. I want to call you to prayer on behalf of the grieving of Evaldi, Texas. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, if one member suffers, all the members are to suffer with it. We know that we can rejoice in Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ is our help in times of storms. No matter how dark that storm is, he promises to be our rod and our staff, the shoulder that we lean on. So I ask that you pray in that regard. 
at a time when grief is so raw and real that the words almost seem probably to those folks as an irritation. We still pray them. It is through our prayers that the power of the Holy Spirit moves to heal, to redeem, and to restore. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, that as we approach the time of his return, quote, lawless deeds will abound, end quote. If there's anything that is happening in our time, it is that lawless deeds are abounding, not only in Texas, but also in Baltimore and around our entire world, our country as well. What do we do at such a time as this? Do we wring our hands lose our hope, lose our focus on Jesus, or rather do we fine-tune our focus on Jesus Christ? Does he not say that we are to keep our eyes on Jesus? Does he not say to visit those in prison as if we were in prison ourselves? So the plan of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that in this time, the body of Christ is the body of Christ. In the weeks to come, we will hear from politicians about answers to how we stop the violence. We'll hear from those in the mental health profession about answers to how we stop the violence. Education officials will offer their solutions. All are valid and worth listening to. But so far as the church of Jesus Christ is concerned, there is but one answer, and it is Jesus. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation in this hour of need. Let us be reminded of Lamentations 3.21, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I wish it were but one item that we had to lament, but there are two. Many of you are aware that this past week, a report dated May the 15th, was prepared by an independent task force created by the Southern Baptist Convention to review allegations of child molestation and sexual abuse by both current and former employees and volunteers of the Southern Baptist Church, churches, and organizations. The report detailed the findings of the task force, including the allegations themselves against the individuals, the perpetrators, the alleged mishandling of those abuse claims, and the alleged cover-up on the part of a few senior members and employees of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. All told, The report noted that over a 20-year period of time, 703 individuals had been alleged to have committed acts of child molestation or sexual abuse while employed by or associated with a Southern Baptist church or institution. In view of the findings of the report, the ministerial staff and the deacon leadership wanted to let you know what we are doing in this very difficult and challenging time. Number one, to the knowledge of the current ministerial staff and deacon leadership of Bethany Church, we have not received any allegation of abuse of any kind upon a youth, child, or adult committed by any employee or volunteer of Bethany Church. However, approximately 25 years ago, An abuse incident did occur by an individual member of Bethany Church, not part of a church-sponsored activity. The event was reported to legal authorities by those involved and was handled accordingly. Number two, the ministerial leadership is in the process of reviewing and updating our current written policies to ensure the safety and security of all attendees at all of our events, including youth, children, and adults. 
Once our review of current written policies is completed, the written policies will be submitted to the church board and deacons for joint consideration and input. These documents will also include a section detailing how any allegation of abuse or misconduct on the part of any employee or volunteer will be received so that the allocation is ha allegation is handled in a manner that ensures that truth is discovered, while at the same time those involved are treated with compassion, sensitivity, and respect. Thirdly, the findings of the recently released report of the SBC task force impacts the lives of many survivors of abuse, as well as others directly or indirectly impacted by the alleged mishandling of their claims. We ask that you pray for their healing, restoration, and complete recovery from the wrongs committed, and that they experience the hands of Jesus as they continue their walk through this valley of shadows. We also ask that you pray that God will redeem their pain by protecting others through a strengthening of policies in the local churches and beyond so that current abuse is not only discovered but also kept from occurring in the future. In Christ's service with you, signed by Pastor Kip and the ministerial staff for Bethany Church and Deacon Chairperson Wayne Carter. So as a community, there are times when we rejoice together, and then there are times that we grieve together, and there are seasons where we lament the hardships and the sins and the struggles. And today we do that, and um, the Psalms is a place to go to as we see David, as he confesses sin, as he expresses lamentation. And so we are going to do that today. I am going to read selected verses from Psalm 31. And I've adapted these verses so that they are not individualist, individualistic, but rather they are corporate, so that we come together as a church family and raise these prayers to God. Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, we have taken refuge let us never be put to shame. Deliver us in your righteousness. Turn your ear to us. Come quickly to our rescue. Be our rock of refuge, a strong force to save us. Since you are our rock and our fortress, for the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. Be merciful to us, O Lord, for we are in distress. Our eyes grow weak with sorrow, our souls and our bodies with grief. But we trust in you, O Lord. We say you are our God. Our times are in your hands. Let your face shine on your servants Save us in your unfailing love. Church, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Let's pray. God, our hearts are sad. We're sad and how the vulnerable the weak have been um, taken away, have been mistreated and violated. We are sad and we grieve. And we ask you, God, to heal our land. We ask you to show us how we can love others, especially those who are walking through the darkness right now. May we be your rod and your staff, your hands, your feet, that are there to support, to be present, to be available. 
And God, I pray that you would help us look at sin, at darkness, even though it's hard to look at. Help us to not stick our heads in the sand, but help us to face courageously the things that need to be faced as a corporate church, God, as the church of Jesus Christ, as a denomination, Lord. Help us to look at those things. I pray, God, for the meetings that are coming forth in the Southern Baptist Convention. God, help the leadership, help the people at the annual meeting to put forth resolutions that provide safety and structure and support, help and accountability, and help us, God, to be merciful, but to be just. And when we don't know what to do, God, we look to you and we ask you to show us, and you've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit. So we're listening. And I thank you, God, for how you lead us, how you strengthen us, how you take us through struggles such as these. And you create in us newness. You give us hope, God. You restore us. So we trust in you for that restoration. We trust in you for reconciliation. We trust in you for renewal regeneration. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers all, that heals all, that trumps all. God, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus who gives us victory in all things. And we look forward to the day, God, when you make all things right. We pray these things in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Would you stand with me for a moment? Yea, King Jesus. May we find our hope in you. Now, precious spirit. Take the words that will be spoken from my mouth and use them, O oh God, to find the place in the heart of the hearers that your word might bear fruit, fruit Father. We'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, church, would you turn with me to the book of Romans? I want us to look at the 12th chapter. We're continuing this series entitled B1, Above All, Put on Love, which is a perfect bond of unity. And today what I'm going to do is this. Um, I really feel like it's very appropriate and, and very timely in terms of uh, the things that happened this past week, the things that have been happening in our nation, our world uh, in the last month, and so I just feel like that it's, the timing is really, really right on. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about metaphors that are in the Scripture uh, that really support the idea or the theme that we've chosen this year of being one. And I want you to see how many times this is found in Scripture. Uh, and then see if we, you think we have drifted from what Scripture says about the body of Christ. So beginning with, with uh, Romans 12, remember that uh, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and the church is really an infant church. And so what he's doing is he's giving instructions about how the people, and of course these people would have been from every, every nationality of that day, Listen to what, what he says to that church in terms of how to be 
the body of Christ. So beginning in verse 3, we read these words. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, that body now he's talking to is about the human body, for as in one body we have many members or parts, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Here's my first point. My research this past week revealed no less than seven metaphors in the New Testament that teach how you and I are to be one with each other. No less than seven metaphors. Each of them has the same teaching that you and I as members of the body of Christ, as members of a local church, and also members of the extended church of Jesus Christ, how we are to be one. Let me show you the first one. It's in this passage that we're looking at in Romans 12. In Romans 12, what we find is the church that as each person who follows Jesus is like a part of the human body. 1 Corinthians 12 goes so far as to say something like this. It says, the eye cannot say to the ear, I have no need of you, because where would the sense of hearing be? So the sense of it is each person represents in the metaphor of the human body a part, a hand, an arm, a leg, an ear, an eye. And each of those parts has a particular role. The body, the human body cannot function unless all the parts are working together to achieve what the purpose of the human body is. So we're like the human body. And then I want to quickly just mention in Romans 8, 15, we're a spiritual family. Every person who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ is actually referred to as an adopted son of the Father. And in, in Matthew, number, Matthew 12, we're referred to as brothers and sisters. You ever heard anybody say, well, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, will you do this, that, and the other? Well, wh where do those phrases come from? They come from the fact that the Bible, Scripture, Jesus says the spiritual family, we are like a separate family, and we're re each related to each other like a brother or a sister. In fact, Jesus is actually at the house of someone performing a miracle. His brothers and his sisters and his mother come, and they say, ask Jesus to come out. Jesus says this in Matthew 12. He says, um, he says, um, he says I do not have a, a mother or brother or sister or mother. The one who does the will of the Father, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. And Jesus literally takes the spiritual family that we have right here and not only parallels it and uses the, the human family as a metaphor, but elevates the spiritual family above it. In Ephesians 5, a marriage, Jesus is the bride. 
And you and I together are, I'm sorry, Jesus is the husband. You and I are the bride. And what Jesus does as the husband is through his death on the cross, he purifies the bride himself. It's not something the bride does, and it's not like there are, if there are 50,000 of, I mean, 500 million Christians for all time, it's not like he says, okay, I got 500 million brides. No. There's one husband, and there's one bride, and they're married to Jesus, and that's the, way, that's the marriage. We're all the bride of Christ. Do you think that communicates oneness? The next metaphor is one that many of you are familiar with. Let's look at the picture, and that is of a flock of sheep. You realize that the only defense that a sheep has is the shepherd. Sheep cannot outrun a predator. They, can't, they don't have horns. They don't have sharp teeth. There's absolutely nothing that a, a sheep can do to protect itself from something that's going to give, um, extract harm upon the sheep. The only hope the sheep have is this shepherd. And in fact, John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I'm not the hired hand shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Says the good shepherd, whenever there's a threat to the sheep, the good shepherd's not like the hired hand shepherd. The hired hand shepherd runs and flees. He says the wolf comes and snatches the sheep. The idea, the concept is that on the outskirts of the flock, a sheep is alone. And because that sheep is alone, that sheep now has lost the protection of the good shepherd and also the protection even of the rest of the sheep because the sheep is protected simply by the sheer numbers in the herd. So do you think that there are things in our day and time that may be separating the sheep from the flock? And when separated from the flock, separated from the good shepherd. He says this in John 10, 16. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. He doesn't say that each denomination, for example, in the body of Christ is a separate flock. He says we are all one flock. In fact, he says this. He says that even Jews and Gentiles become one flock through the cross of Jesus Christ. He says that in Ephesians 2.16. He says that the cross knocks down the barrier, the dividing wall that separates Jews from Gentiles. So together we represent one flock. So my question is, do you think that there are things, again, in our society and in our time that are causing the flock of Christ to be divided one from the other. And if that's the case, do you feel like we have a responsibility as members of the flock to recognize what is dividing us and do everything we can to be one? Look at the fifth metaphor. The fifth metaphor is from 1 Peter 2. Here's what he says. As you come to him, that would be to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. You know what he's saying? This building is made up, the exterior is concrete blocks. Each block's positioned next to the previous one and then um, 
fastened together or held together by concrete. What he says is that every single person, every single person, you are like one of those concrete blocks. And that we are a living stone so that the spiritual house of God is built up. So do you think there might be things in our society today that are causing people not to be a part of the spiritual house of God? And if so, what do we do? He says this in 1 Peter 2. He says that we are, he says, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So if you think about our theme, be one. You see, you can look at it this in one of two ways. You can say, okay, well, that's a real nifty theme. But so what? Isn't it, can it be just like a mission statement that an organization has that no one follows? You know, you develop the mission statement. You say, oh, yeah, that really, that really sounds good. And you just, you know, tuck it away and that's it. You don't think about it again. See, B1 can be just like that. It can be a mission statement that really does, doesn't really have an impact on us. In fact, you may even have thought this. You know, you've asked us to meet up with one another in the month of May. May is meet up month. You may be saying something like this. You, say, you might be thinking, well, pastor, that just seems awful contrived. It just doesn't seem very authentic that I am going to just meet up with someone because it's May meet up month. Well, you know, I would sort of agree with that. But you know, the funniest thing happened. This past week, I had lunch with Mark Leibowitz. We met up. We had a great time together. And I realized, even though it was just a theme it was a theme that had a foundation in Scripture. And the thing you have to understand about Scripture is if God says that we're to do this, that, or the other, he has a good reason and a good purpose. And generally when we do what he says to do, we're the one that gets the benefit. Well, I had the benefit of buying Mark lunch and enjoying every bit of it because we had a theme. I don't want to say try it, you'll like it. What I do want to say is Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So I would rather us look at these metaphors to, and say, okay, Christ, what are you saying to us particularly in a context where Matthew 18 says that in the last days, lawless deeds will abound. And you remember the rest of that verse? People's love will grow cold. If love grows cold, wouldn't you say that we're afraid to be with other people? What does the body of Christ do when we're afraid to be with other people? Afraid for our children to be with other people. Where is Christ in that, you see? And what am I to do if that is my own situation? Do I give in to my fears or do I do what Jesus says? He says, I'm a chosen race. Race? Well, I'm, a, I'm white, I'm Caucasian. That, I guess that would be my, way, my race. I'm, I'm a citizen of the United States. This says that being a Christian, he says it is a chosen race. He not only says it's a chosen race, he says it's a royal priesthood. You know what that means? <laughs> you got to come with me here. You just come with me. You know, hello there, Priest Ernie. How you doing today? Hello there, Priest Alley. How you doing today? Oh, you mean we're a priesthood? I'm not the only priest. I'm the priest of the hood. You know what I'm saying here? So, <laughs> you know what? Every single one of you, every single one of us, Scripture says we're priests. 
We say, well, Pastor, wait a minute. That's what it says. A royal priesthood. Doesn't say that only the called out clergy paid are the priest. It says you are. Mark is. Jason is. Big G. You with me? You feel me? As a younger generation, you feel me here. You feel me. We are a royal priesthood. Holy people, after the report you read a minute ago, Pastor. Yeah. That's why Christ makes the bride ready for himself. And then the last metaphor is something that Sherry mentioned a few weeks ago when she preached from John 17. Jesus says this. It's a powerful statement. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says this. I am no longer in the world. You know, if you think about that one phrase, that one statement, I am no longer in the world. Well, if Jesus is no longer in the world, what is God going to do now? Do you realize that you and I are God's answer to that question? Because we are referred to as the body of Christ. We take the place of Jesus. When he says, I'm no longer in the world, brothers and sisters, come to the mindset that you accept the fact that in God's plan, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a little Christ. Christian literally translated in the Greek is little Christ. Hello, congregation of little Christ. You are God's answer to the fact that Jesus is no longer in the world. Let that sink in. I am no longer in the world, and yet they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, so keep them in your name. The name which you have given me, Jesus, that they may be one. Look at that. He doesn't say, keep them in your name, the name you've given me, that they may be able to perform miracle after miracle after miracle. Or even, he doesn't even say that they may be able to build big churches. No. He says, keep them in my name so that they will be one. Think about that. Now let me show you what I think demonstrates this oneness. No, I'm sorry. I'm not, I got ahead of myself. Let me go to the second point. The second point goes this way. Believers have an interconnected reciprocal relationship one with the other. Romans 12, verse 4 says this, For as in one body we have many members, okay? That's the human body as a metaphor. And what he says, we have many members, just like we got an arm, we got a leg, we got a hand, so forth, so on. We have many members. And the members do not have all the same function. So I got a left eye, I got a right eye, I got a left ear, and I got a right ear. They don't do the same thing. Because if they did the same thing, I wouldn't be able to hear. All are different. They do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. We are one body in Christ. And individually, members one of another. That is the phrase. In fact, there are two words, one word and one phrase in this verse that really, you've you got to really sit on. One is function. 
The word in the Greek is praxis, and what it basically means is it implies a sustained activity and or responsibility, a role or a part. Every single one of us has a function, has a role, a part to play. Then the other one is that last phrase that says, and individually we're members one of another. I don't understand what that phrase means. I don't understand how is it possible that I can be a member of Ernie or of Austin. That's what it says, literally. We are members one of the other. Let, that, let your mind sit here. Come on with me. Members one of another? I can say, I can understand members of the body. But not, how can my hand be a member of my hand? You know what he's saying? This is incredible. The Greek word has this meaning. Reciprocal. Members one of another translates a Greek word that means a reciprocal, responsible relationship between entities. There is the sense of there is a reciprocal dependence mutually upon each other for some action. For example, you expect X from me. I expect Y from you. Really important. Not only does each one of us have a separate function, each one of us should have an expectation of each other. It's reciprocal. Doesn't just go one way. It goes both ways, and that's the only way that you will be able to be one in the body of Christ. Now, let's look at this picture, and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, now this is the picture of this is the Herndon Monument where? In Annapolis, it's 20, 21 feet high, and it is covered with 50 pounds of lard. And these are plebes, which are first-year um, 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 naval people. And at the end of their first year, what they do is they try to put a upperclassman's hat on the top of that monument. And it's a rite of passage where they're no longer considered plebes. Now they are upperclassmen. Okay, and so it's a rite that's been going on since 1950. Okay, now how in the world are we going to get, how are we going to get a hat on the top of that monument unless there is function and reciprocal responsibility on the part of each person that's there? Let's play the video. This is last Monday. I have to give a speech today. <laughs> there are a couple things I want to hit on. I should not be up here. 
there. I didn't do the hard job. The people in the base, the guys on the bottom, you guys. And then you got the top level. And do you realize that the only way this works is if there is a reciprocal function that takes place? These guys have locked their arms. You can't hold on to a, an obelisk with 20, 50 pounds of, of, of lard on it unless what you do is you grab arms. And now together, what you can do is accomplish a mission and a purpose that you see is bigger than yourself. Church, do you think the mission that Jesus gave us to go into the world and make disciples of all the nations is a bigger, more important mission than putting an upperclassman's hat on the top of that monument? Because if we can learn anything from this monument and this scene is that the only way we're going to accomplish our mission is to lock arms. For each of us to have a function. Each of us to have a responsibility. And then let God bless us as we move forward. Look at the next picture. You saw this picture a few weeks ago. Here's what I want you to do. Then what we did is I showed you this picture to show that until all 16 or 21 of these separate threads were woven together, all this was was 17, 16 or 17 separate threads that they didn't have a purpose. It's only as they were woven together that they made a shawl. Now let me ask you this. Okay, do you all need to stand up? Because i got a little bit further to go. If, if you need to stand, you just go right ahead. Because this is good. It's good. Here it is. Now, look, listen to this. Each one of these threads, this is one color. That's one thread. But notice that each one of the other threads around it, it's interwoven with a different color. I want you to think about what is happening in the interweaving of the threads. Because there is support that is going on when there is an interweaving. You and I live in a time when our kids can grow up and they can interweave with the wrong threads. Why do you think it should matter to you whether your children are involved in what we do on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. I'll tell you why. Because as they grow to become teenagers and youth, it's going to be very difficult for them to unweave if somehow in the process they got connected to a thread that's leading them in a way contrary to what God wants them to do. You see, what we do is we let our children tell us how they want to weave their threads. It seems to me as parents and as grandparents, we have a responsibility to say, hmm, I just don't think this is where I want you to weave your threads. And I don't want you to hear me saying that this is the reason for what happened this past week. But I want to ask you this question. And I want you just to think about it. How is it possible that an 18-year-old boy who does not have a record, there are no charges against him, 
On the day after his 18th birthday, he goes and buys two AR-15s. We then find out that on his social media posting, he posted about going to shoot up an elementary school. And do you know that on social media what happens is once you identify the thread that you're interested in, they start bombarding you with threads that believe just like you do. And suppose this young man got bombarded with people who supported violence and hatred and murder. And the next thing we know, when he says he's going to go shoot some kids up, nobody lets the police know. They support him in what he's doing. What am I saying? Am I saying if your children do not have godly relationships that that's going to happen to them? I'm not saying that at all. But I do know this. I know that the relationships that our children form early become the relationships that they continue. Let me just tell you the most beautiful sight, that one of the most beautiful sights I saw um, during the pandemic. This was like the first Sunday that we were able to, to, to meet beyond a limit of 15 people. And we were on the front yard. And there were two little girls. One was already on the front yard. The other one was being let off by her family in the parking lot. And you know what? Those two little girls saw each other. They saw each other, and they just took off running as fast as they could to see each other, and they just fell in each other's arms and, and tried to hold each other, but they were going so fast, and one of them didn't know when to stop, and just boom, and they just fell flat on the ground. One of them broke their glasses. And what is my point? That was a relationship that was formed in the body of Christ. That is the kind of relationship that as these little girls grow and mature, those are the kinds of relationships we want so our children don't go the wrong way. Let me show you the next picture. Can you believe this? Can you just look at this? Does Riley not know he's walking out when Braden's on the screen? Look at this. Here is Braden right here. This is the Mount Hebron Chamber Choir. Is that right, Tori? That's the Mount Hebron Chamber Choir. And where are they singing? Oriole Park, Camden Yards, right before the Orioles game this past week. Now, let me ask you a question. I can assure you that these are all really good singers. And I don't know anything about the rules for the Mount Hebron Choral uh, Chamber Course, but here's a guess. Number one, every person is assumed to sing. If you're going to be a part of this chorus... It is assumed that when you get the microphone, you will sing. You can't be a part of this chorus and say, okay, well, today I think I'm going to go to the movie. <laughs> no, you say, every person is assumed to sing. Every person also, don't know the rules, but I'm guessing, every person is assumed to sing. Every person has a function. My guess is they're sopranos, they're altos, they're tenors, and they're basses. So you have a function, a part. You're assumed to be present. You have a part. Then it's assumed that what you will do is you will listen to all these people, particularly the ones standing on either side of you. Because the objective is not for you to be the dominant singer. The objective is that all these voices will come together and they will blend. In the body of Christ, what God calls us to do is, number one, be present. Number two, to have a function, have a role. 
Number three, to love one another by listening to everybody else instead of you, you thinking you're number one and you got the microphone so you're going to use it to your advantage. So that in total, what happens is we make beautiful music together. Because let's suppose that for some reason, the centerpiece <laughs> wasn't there. Let's suppose he didn't show, he didn't show, he didn't show. Now, somehow, we got to take these three out and sing the song that's designed to include all of them, and they're not there. How are we going to do that? By the power of God, that's true. But anyway, you understand where I'm going. So look at the last point. The last point is worthwhile you listening. I promise. When believers exercise their gifts together, God makes beautiful music. Verse 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Last picture. Is Noah in the, is he in the foyer? Yeah, let's see if we can get Noah in here. Noah's missing. Noah, come on in. So, Noah, let me ask you a question. Okay, so how many keys? 88. 88. How many white ones? Uh, Say 55. 55. How many black ones? It's 36. <laughs> okay, now, so whatever it is, anyway. So, okay, maybe I had the math. Maybe it's 52. So, Noah, let's suppose, what would cause these three keys not to play? Any Give me one. What if the spells of the hammer hmm, You mean because we got the windows open? Yeah. <laughs> Can you just believe that? Can you just look at that? Those windows right there, you know what they let in? They keep us from getting a pandemic. But do you know what they let in? Humidity. And you know what happens? This has to be tuned up all the time because the keys get moisture in them. And then what happens is they don't play the right sound. Brothers and sisters, do you think that if we all represented a key on this keyboard, that there were times in your life that you got too much moisture and you weren't making the right sound? Here's how this works. Each one of us is a key on the keyboard. Each key plays a specific part. That's what is clear in both Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. There are, there are not parts that are the same. They each have a different function. So then, it matters if we think that our presence is irrelevant because you have a role. You have a specific part. You have a specific spiritual gift. That's what Scripture says. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. And now because of that fact, every person, every person in this room, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you have a specific spiritual gift. Tori, can you sing like Tori? I can't. But Tori can. What if Tori said, can't make it today? Do you ever say that? See, because if we all have, if there are 88 keys, oh, do you know what? I'm one of the keys as a pastor. See, let's suppose I was this key right here. You know what that says? Number, who said I'm middle C? Is that what you said? 
Suppose I'm middle C. And suppose as middle C, suppose I have a specific function. I lead. That's my function. Suppose I say, I'm tired of leading. I'm tired, I'm tired of making decisions. Suppose I say, I don't want to talk about these issues that are in our, our society that are contrary to God's word. Suppose I said, I don't want to lead anymore. Well, then I'd be violating Scripture because my function is to be one among all the keys. you got to see that. I'm just a middle C. I just have a role. My role happens to be leader. As the leader, I can't think that I'm, only, I'm the only key on the keyboard. Because if I think I'm the only key on the keyboard, I'm violating the entire gist and principle and, and spiritual truth of Scripture. No, I'm just like you. Just like you. But I have a role. And because I have that role, you should expect me to lead. That is what you should expect. It's reciprocal. You should expect me to lead. And you know what else? I should expect you to follow. Now, if I'm leading you contrary to God's word, don't follow. But if we're walking in the will of God as brothers and sisters... There is a reciprocal expectation. And it's not, I'm just using me as an example. You could put Ed. Maybe Ed is middle D <laughs> or middle F, whatever that key is. Well, let's suppose that's what he is. What does that mean? He has a role. He has a function. Let's suppose Beth back there is one of the white keys right here. What is that key? Nobody knows. Okay, so we'll say Beth is right here. Let's suppose Beth decides she's going to let humidity get into her life, so now her key doesn't work anymore. You with me here? Do you think the pandemic and on, the, the marvel of online viewing causes us to think that it doesn't matter whether I'm a part of the, of the keyboard? Let's suppose that this key is, one, is a giver. No, everybody's supposed to be a giver. But let's suppose the main giver says, I'm not giving no more. You understand where I'm going with this? No, the principle of Scripture is, number one, every single person is a part. Every single person has a function. Every single person should be expected to exercise their spiritual gift and should expect others to do the same thing. So that in total, here's what happens. Here is God. That's God. What God does, he plays the keys. And we make beautiful music. That's how it works. So if there's anything... This caused us to get lost from that model. We got to reclaim it. So how can we implement? Do you need, do we need a change of mind? Number one, about connecting with other believers. About accepting that I have a role to play. About taking a first step in that role. About believing that I am needed about believing that I need you. Next, this next week, meet up with someone from church. Try a staff person. I love Mission Barbecue. Just give me a call. <laughs> what about a member of your lifeline group, your, life, your lifeline class, or your life group? Thirdly, how can you rely on the help of other believers around you? Because, see, that's the way this works. You're a thread in the entire pattern, and we help one another and support one another. How can you rely on the help of others? 
Do you see how asking help from others, do you see asking help from others as an imposition on them? Or a gift to them? Got to get that. Because most of us have a hard time asking for help. Biblically, serving you is a gift to me. Two from last week, I want you to, if you don't have a time with the Lord right now, I want you to start reading the Gospels. Whatever strikes you, write it down. I want you to talk or email someone about what you discovered. I would love to receive an email from John Doe that says, Pastor, I was looking at John chapter 1 this week, and here's what God said to me. Lastly, memorize Colossians 3.14. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And we'll quote it next Sunday. Okay, let's stand as I close us in prayer, as our wonderful musicians come up to play some beautiful music. Let me pray with you as they do so. Let's pray. Father, I bless the precious name of Jesus Christ. You are good and holy, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for how your word teaches us what your plan is for our individual lives and for our corporate life as a church. I pray, O oh God, that your word would reach our hearts and that we, Father, would act on what we have heard. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Yeah, let's give the last thing. Yeah, that's good. Okay, would you be seated just for a second? And Tracy's got a couple things. Yeah, so um, it's, it's kind of fitting that we've been talking about B1 and unifying and coming together um, because next Sunday is our church picnic. And yeah, here we go. Thank you, thank you. Very excited. So um, we need you to come together and be one with us and not only come to the picnic, but we need you to sign up. The church is gonna provide hot dogs and hamburgers, but we are in need of a lot of food. We need side dishes, particularly, and desserts. So um, if you're not computer savvy and you just want to see me and say, hey, Tracy, what do you need? You can check me out after church. Um, and I'm actually going to email out that link as well, but it is also on the church website. So we ask that you join us. We're going to have a moon bounce for the kiddos, um, some uh, water play fun for the kiddos as well, and uh, lots of great food. So we really hope that you'll join us and be one. Okay, and then last but not least, Grace. So, so whoa, oh, whoa. oh, so yes. the service is going to be over, say, twelve o'clock. Right. And the picnic starts at one. Yeah. So, I mean, what am I supposed to go home and come back? Well, it's up to you. I mean, you're welcome. If you want to stay and help us set up, you could. Stay. Well, what if I don't want to help you set up, but I just want to stay? Can then I just... I'll call you out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you're you're I welcome. I mean, what if I like live fifteen minutes away? If you live 15 minutes away. Can I just stay? You can stay. Absolutely. So is the food going to be ready at 1? The food will be ready at 1. At 1. Okay. Yes. So what if I don't want to do the sign up? And you just want to show up? I just want to show up with my food. Well, that would be fine. That would be fine. That would be fine. That's what I, I thought so. Although I get a little nervous when there's no sign up. So. I don't mind not having sign ups. I know you okay. don't. <laughs> I know you don't. Okay. So next, see, so yeah, we got a question right back there for you. Yes, question. Absolutely. Oh, please. Oh, yes. We're not allowed not to invite. <laughs> Everybody. Each one, bring one. Each one, reach one. Each yeah. one, reach one. Yeah. No. Just come. No, just come. Just the come. The registration is for our benefit. Just, just so, yeah. Just so I know if we have enough food and if I need to go get more. Yeah. That's all it is. Some people are very detail-oriented. The rest of us sort of just move with the you know, flow. And So anyway, you just move with the flow if you need to, but just show up next week. Not an obligation. A gift we're giving to you. Yes. That's what we're doing. We're giving you a gift to be one. We're giving you that gift. So you know what? You can show up, and you know by doing that, you will actually be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> is that not a deal? That is a deal. Yes. All right, so the babies join and then suit in that back there. Okay. Absolutely. So one I, more thing, one more thing. Okay. Uh, Grace, just stand up for me, just so everybody can see who you are. Grace White is leaving next Sunday. She's going on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, and um, she is actually having a little bake sale out in the lobby. So um, if you guys want to get a little sweet treat, uh, make a donation or uh, offer some prayer for Grace, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, okay? Let's, let's stand and we'll close with prayer. God is good. You know that? He is really good. Father, we just honor the good name of Jesus Christ in this place. I pray the name of Jesus Christ upon us. Bless us, Father, as we walk in your will. We give you praise. In Jesus' name.